Okay, well, let me start recording. So with the 3D printers, demonstrating a $10,000 per month business that can be rep replicated easily anywhere is a very unique thing because, I mean, nobody else is doing this. This is, this is distributive enterprise in, in um, manifestation. Here we're saying, okay, we can teach you exactly how to do this business. Now, FarmBot, as I mentioned to you, that's a really good example too. It's not what I would call a distributive enterprise like by... Like it doesn't have an explicit focus to train others. It, it enables it by open documentation, which is really cool. Uh, but for us, it, I think it's a very unique thing that if a few people did that worldwide, I mean, I think the world could be a, a different place with a distributive enterprise. So if we can show the 3D printer and then deriving from that, naturally the, the open source everything store, the fact that 3D printers and other basic small micro factories are producing a lot of the economic output that um, now comes from centralized sources. And right now there's a lot of discussion about jobs, right? Uh, people mm -hmm. being out of work. And I think if we think about it, there there is there's potential impact there. Like if we can actually contribute to that, that would be a pretty amazing thing as far as getting a lot of people producing in distributed micro factories a lot of people are talking about the resilient supply chains right now but so that's that's my side yeah. uh tell me yeah so thank you for doing some good work on all this stuff like the templates i was just looking at your info box marketing template looks pretty good um what do you want me to look at and so we get focused on the curriculum um, yeah yeah uh, let's see. Maybe I can share screen. Yeah. Um, where am I? Let's see which one is which. Let's try this one. Okay. Can you see where I'm? Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So yeah. So if we start with the curriculum, because that's kind of the. Uh, one of the blockers were well, the curriculum and, and the actual schedule, but um, like uh, what we actually want to deliver, um, which modules, the module breakdown, especially since there are some differences between uh, mm -hmm. different ideas of, of how to do things, for example, the simplifications and such. Um, and also, I'm thinking not only about the first four days, but like the other. Uh, day five and day six and day seven to day nine. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of bullet points for what to include in these things. Um, and I don't know if that has been structured before or if it's something which might Marketing, how to do um, Product photo shoot, um, business mm -hmm. and product strategy, uh, something like that, um, or combine a little bit, or or if it's you rather have it uh, more as an open box and then people do. I don't know how how did you do it uh, last January and in the summer before uh, for the product weeks, especially the last days. How did we do it? How did that look? Yeah, like was it just a very structured approach or was it... Um... Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, first of all, we didn't have a lot of people participating and the guys in for January and the guys in Europe were delayed, so they didn't participate, but it was the Raspberry Pi tablet. And it's, uh, we were doing what we could. Part of it was mm -hmm. also like that we had really slow internet and it took us forever to get the image down, which, you know, things like that. So we didn't get far on it at all, but it, it's... Uh, it should be a coordinated thing. Well, I mean, coordinated. I mean, coordinated at the same time that, that it's experimental and we're developing, doing real development work. So yeah. um, we don't have a good model for how exactly that looks outside of, okay, it's like a hackathon, like a almost like a startup camp concept yeah. where uh, the more people there are, the more different tasks can be done. And I think the best thing we can do is to prepare a collaboration architecture so perhaps draw up a document. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, I've been you know, putting up all these pages on collaboration architecture, like for example, collaboration <coughs> architecture log, you've probably seen. But the idea is you have to, the best thing we can do, 
let me look at collaboration architecture log see if there's anything I can show you the idea is that that people want to understand we want to teach people you want to teach people what it means to uh, to work together across many many roles so part of it is just expanding as one's one's knowledge of on one side there's techniques we can do to break down projects along module based design on the other hand we can break apply that same technique technique of product development to that like the team development here's the team that can do all these things like if we have marketing people or graphics people they can produce an infographic if we've got a programmer on that in that session they can do like say it's if it's the raspberry pi tablet they can look into the new operating system or even drawing an operating system up from scratch if it's the filament <coughs> maker they could be doing the code for the arduino like there's many many roles like you can literally come up with like a hundred roles or a few hundred roles and everybody could work meaningfully as long as they understand that the collaboration architecture works like that you can that you can involve all the people and first by breaking down all the tasks along the product development methodology um, and then the whole thing across the team breaking down the team into many different tasks. so so basically like the scrummies the task allocation the modular breakdowns of products those are all relevant for making a super complex task into bite-sized chunks and then there's the the test driven design part the rapid prototyping that you can test things readily to give you an example and that and that's like so many people can be doing that rapid tests paper models uh, CAD CAD designs calculations that's all um, test driven design where you, where you design a test for something like give you an example yesterday uh, <laughs> I did this so we do want to build a pellet stove at one point it's part of the energy thing like it's integrated with uh, like all this energy infrastructure for a house but yesterday i was i had a heat gun out there and it's like oh this thing is hot uh, i put it onto a piece of cardboard and it caught fire in 10 seconds well that's a good test driven design for an igniter for a pellet stove so I actually docu I, I like went, went out of my way to actually document that say, hey, this is a, in 10 seconds you can use a heat gun like this to light uh, biomass, like readily, things like that. But the point is, uh, what I'm driving at is that there's, there's an, a whole ecology of, of roles and steps that can be taken on at the same time. And for the five project days, uh, that's, that's what we should be focusing on, to how do we coordinate people well to do that so there has to be good documentation happening so modular documentation um, that we're coordinating because it's really I mean this whole game of the steam camp is and, and like all that we do here it's about how do you get effort like people are going all these random directions but if you can coordinate that effort to a very tangible and explicit goal I mean you can do wonders and magic and you can change the economy I mean that's our premise and for which reason like if you can get that infrastructure of how to do that that process of how to do that like we could solve that gvcs thingy in a matter of months to a year and that's actually what i what i what i thought like back in 2011 it's like oh yeah look we can you know 2011 2012 2013 at that time i was saying oh yeah we're gonna get this thing done in like a year or two and mm -hmm. then of course you learn more that, that it's um there's a lot that's needed for that but the basic premise that's needed is if you can coordinate in an organized way yes you absolutely can do this yes it's quite doable but it requires organization and one and after in 2020 i'm saying well it's not really all those tools that are the super critical thing it's actually the mindset of people because we've been so uh, brainwashed into a certain way of thinking or, or developing that that's one of the big things we're actually struggling against which is my you know my latest thoughts on a topic in 2020 like seven years after thinking that the GVCS is done in a year or two so so that's what we're working with okay Does that kind of uh, give a framework for the five days uh, yeah um, so I mean, there, there is quite a lot of, of um, text on the wiki regarding uh, this collaboration and and also some description on you have a lot of bullet points for for 
uh, day seven and nine and five and six also. Mm -hmm. um, but it does add some thoughts. Um, what I'm thinking in that case is maybe that it would be good to kind of uh, distill. I try to distill some things I think is important and another people can, you know, uh, agree or disagree. But if we distill like the most core things which would be important for a project to manage, um, right now it is quite like linear um, in modularity. First, some collaborate, collaborative documentation, then you use the skill to finalize the product you use before in the wiki, and then some theory, and then you apply the theory and so forth. But um, what you're saying is that, um, or if I rethink it based, based on what you're saying, is that if we define the most important lessons and have all of those in place, so we have all of the perspective, so if there wouldn't be uh, if we wouldn't get a diverse team, let's say we only get programmers for some reason, then we still have the curriculum to go through all of the skills so that they can set up their own company. Uh, however, if there would be diversity, then we would be able to split the team up to, to different modules so, um, so that we have one curriculum which we can go through in case there's only generalists. And then if there are specialists, we can start to kind of uh, and go into different streams, uh, more or less. Of course, we have to start with this streaming, how to do streaming in, in that case. Um, in, um, that would be one theoretical point of doing. And I think like starting, for example, with, with as we, we have design thinking in the marketing, maybe we can start with some design thinking. Uh, and I talked with Wendy, who want to be an instructor earlier uh, during summer before this COVID-19 started. And uh, she can help probably with, with uh, module and design thinking, and then we can apply that for the Shreddy project. And um, well, basically, combine what's important to get the job done, and then then we have to tweak it based on the team uh, in place. Yeah. So that we don't have the idea that, that uh, we will have all of the different roles in place. And if we don't have it, they will not be able to start their business. Right. Um, and then if there's a remote participation option, like, okay, yeah, there has to be a, a uh, core curriculum. So say whoever shows up, we still publish and blast on the internet our latest thoughts on how do you do this collaborative design, which will be recorded for the remote sessions and also recorded for people to see afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so cover like through all the camps, the goal is, yeah, it is about starting open source product development as a mainstreamable methodology for developing products so we have to provide the various skills and that show must go on no matter who shows up the more materials we have on that the more quality we, the more um, focus we can provide to people add more value to the situation yeah uh, now yes. one one last thing i want to bring this thing like if we talk about collaboration architecture have you heard of zachman ontology uh no Okay, Second look at that page on the wiki because that's another way to reframe like the collaboration architecture. All right, and not the epistemology. It sounds almost like. Yeah. Isn't ontology like truth or no existence? Let's see. Where is it? What's ontology? <clears throat> okay, I pasted a link. Zachman ontology. That's actually. This comes from I first heard about it from the guy who did Velocar. If you remember Jan Lachetti from a few years ago, he did. He was working on this open source, super efficient electric car. We had a little workshop here to do that, but he brought that up. That's a, I think that's a great topic, great uh, concept to be aware of. It's basically how you you view a problem from different perspectives. You could be mm -hmm. looking at it as an engineer, an architect, an artist, um, a businessman, okay. and that requires different like the way. Uh, mm -hmm different assets that you bring into that picture but altogether the entire project has all those views in one that's why i like it it's a framework framework how you how you analyze a problem or how you represent the problem yeah but take a look at that that's i think that's useful that, that's a pretty advanced concept I, I think it's kind of some of the cutting edge. if you look at like let's see on wikipedia it's does it say anything We talk about like UML diagrams, universal markup language. Ah, 
This is where if you if you understand these three radical frameworks and, and these other paradigms, you can talk about um, artificial intelligence injection into the whole problem. So you can, like with a module-based approach, you can start talking about getting processes that then can be automated. Anyway. Um, uh, just a question. Do you see my presentation or am I sharing the wrong thing? I think I see it, yeah. No, I so no, you I'm, see the no, no, I'm not. I'm I'm seeing the. I'm seeing Slack. Ah, okay. Let's see. Uh, let's try to change. Ah, okay. That explains a few things. All right. Okay, um, and so another question regarding the, so you, you can see the presentation now. Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, send a link in the wow. chat box. So that's in the chat box right now. The, yeah. In the chat box, it's, I added the link. Yep. yep. Um, and all the links are also in the um, meeting bullet points. Uh, where are you keeping the meeting log? There's a, there's a, dev team log on the wiki are you keeping it there just for organization uh, this one yeah, but it's to the chat log as well if that's what you mean do you mean so, the um... you know there's a page called development team log dev team log um i've seen here's here's this um uh, maybe maybe try to there it is. Um, that's we've been keeping that page for years. So, well, that's the April twenty twenty, but that's linked from here. Um, um, all right. Where where oh. did you so for the team meeting notes? Where do we access that through your log or through where? You can let it access it um, through the chat. It's the, well, yeah, uh, no, the... but I mean for, uh, yeah, right now we do, but but for permanent, like say I come back five years from now oh, yeah. and say, hey, where's um, the meeting? Yeah, I think I have it on my log. Okay, um, yeah, put it on a dev team log. That's been there since uh, we've been keeping that since 2017, with a okay. little gap in uh, 2019 there. Yep. Um, right. Okay. Go ahead. So some questions regarding the first day, um, like the first four days. So um, um, there were a lot of, well, there, there were some documents regarding building a drill plotter slash pen. Um, yeah. So pen drill. Yeah. Yeah, we did that successfully in March. Have you seen like the Facebook pictures of that? And uh, not Facebook pictures. I saw it in the March. Yeah. Yeah. March. Yeah, it's an embedded Facebook post in there. But yeah, the March one. Yeah, we did that. So yeah, that works right now. So we can do things like CNC holes. We can do the pen plotting. Yeah. Hmm. Now the the pen plotter thing, like some somebody made a mod where we're attaching that we have an attachment right now to the actual 3D printer head. So we can, we don't even have to take the tool head off. You just put a pen in there and it uses the sensor, the height sensor to get the height leveling. So that, that can work. Haven't done it, the Europeans guys, European guys have done it. I'm not sure, I think that works right now. I'm not sure if there's any issues like about a, like a little spring been, being needed in there. I don't know if you know anything about that, Jessica, but I think it works out of the box where you just put in a pen and inst instead of running the printer, you run the pen. Sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, maybe I can increase the volume. The one with the head um, is on, what's his name? Log in Texas, uh, Don's log. He just attached the pen to the rest of the head. It doesn't have the drill though. Those the European guys, like that picture you just saw, they did they did that with the drill and the pen and got both to work. And yeah, that would be the thing. 
I think. It's a, you have to separate, you have to take the other one off. I don't think you could attach all of that to the printing head. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the drill part is, I already, just touching one of those drill heads, I broke it. So there, you know, definitely has to be set up right. <laughs> yeah, you gotta set it up right. For example, yeah. like what I did was, first of all, the first thing I did was cut off the bit like yeah cut it halfway so it's much shorter and it, therefore more uh, much yeah. more stable but this is the one that there's a video of them working already with this like it's drilling i think they're doing something weird like holding it in their hands rather than having it clamped to the board but <laughs> i mean it definitely would work this stuff the pieces are all here yeah yeah so i'm is, trying to print that thing now and it should work it just oh, i just had a wiring thing come unplugged but i think i can I think it'll come out properly now so I'll finish I can go through that those steps and document it more thoroughly I mean one thing my question I guess in listening to this I'm sort of assuming that I, I guess how you, you imagine this happening live somehow still like there's still like live webinar presentations that are recorded and then made accessible or is everything or many pieces pre organized like pre-organized is best but see the thing is yeah. about pre-organization pre mm -hmm. evolution ahead. right like we'll we'll do the yeah. pre-recording -record and then the next time we find something even way better and then we want to go to that so so it's kind of like constantly well, and it evolving cuts out yeah but this is it so has, so remember my discussion just, about the collaborative video edit stuff like with Caden live that's why we want yeah. to learn as a team to do the collaborative editing so that when we do this video, it's not outdated next month because we already got new stuff. So that's where we can download the source and then redo the video, just a little clip of it or whatever. But maybe like the best approach is tight. If that was efficient, that'd be impressive. If that it was efficient. I mean, efficient. That's, yeah. Look, that's an industry standard process. They use professional software for that. We can simulate that where the repo is like yeah. YouTube videos. We can do that. We just got to do it just one of those uh, things we uh, we would want to develop it's basically like developing the team skill to do that yeah um, let me see I'm yeah. gonna send this and think how popular that skill is at this point All, every single university has online courses now right. <laughs> so but it's a you know strange you no know, it's strange anyway so Martin how or how do you do that with Kaden Live do you store the video files on cloud or yeah, there's uh, uh why clearly you, first thing you what do is look at the collaborative again? video edit protocol on the wiki. Um, the wiki of the collaborative video protocol. Let me um, let me show. You. But the basic idea there is, I mean, it's worth bringing up. I mean, we're, I mean, eventually you want to get this like soon. Uh, so take a look at that. But basically, you do a Caden Live file. What Caden Live? The way Caden Live works is you have a folder with all the videos and images. For the videos. Well, that's a big deal because you can't just transfer big videos if it's gigabytes of them, right? So all you do is mm -hmm. upload them to YouTube, and then the first step before you start the edit files, you you go to the the list of links with all the videos, just download them all into your folder, and then you're then you're editing from the same source files, and then the project, like so, say you download that, you have the Caden Live file, you've got all the other files. Another person, Jessica, can then download that Caden Live file and download all the links of the, all the videos and assets, and she can edit the same video. So that's that's the essential idea. It's just about having the assets, and the assets are stored best on a place like YouTube, which is large and free at this mm -hmm. point. But I mean, of course, we can. That that's a workflow we can develop, like right now. Uh, it's yeah. it's doable right now with just like a wiki template you could create a wiki template where we kind of help guide people through that process um but yeah 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 i think that would be quite good so uh, just uh, one question and martin regarding this drill is this instead of cnc or is it in addition to the cnc no that is uh, i mean so so look at this so the for clarity the concept is we've got this cnc axis of three dimensions xyz and we put all kinds of heads on it. One is the first one is the 3D printer, which allows us to print the other things. But then you just replace that with a plotter, with a drill, um, with other things like a like a, for example a vinyl cutter or a little laser cutter. Those are two other things we haven't touched that. And it's like, I think some sometime it would be interesting to do that. 
because those are just very simple add-ons to the same system. So what I'll I definitely, definitely try a cutter with a pen if I can get it to work. Because even with the vinyl cutter, with my lovely, well, I don't know vinyl or whatever. This my this is my my box. I see with, with the with the Raspberry Pi, it's in a box. This is a found box, but it could just as quickly be a, you know, made. You know, you draw the plan for the box and built. You just then it'd be like two. You'd be like, boop. There's my, and you can modify it more easily. That's so, true. If you I, I just thought a... it makes sense to have a be able to cut a piece of cardboard it'd be awesome so that yeah. would be a small laser cutter like a like a four watt laser cutter can cut mm -hmm. construction paper thin cardboard so yes mm -hmm. what you just said is an exact prototyping chain that we want to develop for the big machines too which is say we're cutting out a tractor well let's mm -hmm. get out some cardboard and cut it because we cut stuff from flat steel to and then weld it into 3d shapes so you cut it from cardboard, you fit you everything in five online. minutes and it costs you a, a dollar to prototype a tractor and the way it all comes together. Oh dear, so, wait, you already have that cutting at the large scale? Well, oh. we don't. We actually do have a laser wait, saw here, but we ended up never... We have a laser oh. saw, laser cutter, which is like, I don't know, three by four feet. But we actually never ran it for the reason that it's... Uh, we want to actually simplify that design, so we never finished it. Um, okay, so I can be uh, when it comes to the curriculum. Then how does it impact? My yeah, so so that's thoughts for I later. Can. But for now, the the relevant thing is we've got the tool heads like the plotter, which is excellent. You can draw pictures, uh, and you can learn the, the workflow of Inkscape. Now yeah, there is a be, bunch of detail well, there, like to refine to that process. Right. So you, so you go from imagination to to the plot. Like that's very useful, but it does require a skill set, and it's all like really not accessible until someone does a really good job documenting all of it. So there's pieces, and that's what we're talking about. We're trying to streamline that so so that you can really effectively do plots of any kind, including circuit plots. So that means going from KiCad and exporting that, so you can actually draw it for a circuit that then can be etched. So that's two purposes: one is drawings, and two is circuits. And then okay. then for the the CNC C drill, that's cool because then you can make the holes, for for example, to build it, put in an Arduino chip on a circuit board. You could do that. Yeah. Um, uh, the other, just one. So I can, yeah. So I can delete uh, the build up circuit plotter and the build CNC drill, and then it will only be one module which builds the combined. Yeah, you can, right. If we print the, the module that Jessica pointed to, that has two of them in one. So yeah. that's, that would be a streamlining if we talk about, okay, now we put the two prints into one, which is, yes, that's a good optimization yeah. there. Uh, and the other question was, uh, so I've done that in, in the first uh, one here, and the other question was uh, regarding the actual exercise. So so you build it first, um, yeah. and then there is a plotting and drill exercise with Inkscape. Yeah. Um, and then before that, for the CNC machine, there's a Marlin for well, CNC that, milling. Hold on a second. That the Inkscape thing, uh, that may be on day two, right? If we did the plotter, we want to use it because the plotter is like a quick, you know, it's a simple attachment that you can attach. But then when you built it, like you, you do want to see the fruits of it, so probably get that lesson in there on day two, if possible. Uh, yeah, the what I was thinking was because day two we would already finish at around six o'clock. Okay. Um, so yeah. that's why I moved it at, at day three. If we're gonna build um, electric motors, if we're gonna build electric motors as well. Um, yeah, no, that's um, no, we haven't. We can do like simple, inefficient ones. Yes, we can do that. We haven't done that. That that hasn't been that hasn't happened in the camps yet. Maybe we can add that towards the end. For what? I can do at the at the motor part towards the end options, right? Like shredder, electric motor. Well, that would be yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, like if we're doing a shredder, the the project. filament making steam camp, actually building a prototype motor would be a really good thing. That'd be cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's put it in a project phase okay. if we want to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm just gonna say something else. Andreas about that curriculum. So like the plotting pen and drill. So first you run through the thing with Inkscape showing how you take a sticker or a you know writing thing and make the 
make the printer make that mark, right? And then you could do the same thing with the KiCad. The KiCad stuff, the next step would be make it draw that with the permanent marker, draw your circuit and drill it. And then you know, do the etching. We did this, we did this like hand-drawn version in, in January. So that whole process would be part of the printed um, different tool head type you know, process. So all of that will, I think it'll come together more clearly than it might feel at this moment. And then I can just try to build it out that way. Like it's one sequence that you go from plotter with just like some image that's a sticker to get your speaker circuit Jessica. Plotting, circuit your drilling. Speaker. oh sorry yeah so you go from plotting a sticker to plotting a circuit drawing the circuit with a permanent marker because then you can etch it right it'll it'll leave that to do the etching do the permanent circuit drawing with the marker and drill it with the drill on the printer we did this uh, all manually in January in Texas so that would all be done with this tool head attachment and you're saying a sticker that like an OSC sticker or something like that yeah like an OSC sticker in March I had one that was ready that was a, a hand drawing actually it was like a poem that was like handwritten and I was just gonna make the machine like draw my writing you know <laughs> make it you know look human sort of but anyway so yeah it could be kind of fun it's just like what type of image do you need oh crap what type of image do you need um, that kind of thing just the steps of going yeah, through yeah, yeah. Inkscape, yeah. Yeah. Um, and this would be part of the plotting and drill combined exercise. Right. So that would be the first part of like using the pen and the plotter, the Inkscape, and then that will they'll flow right into using the same system to drill and draw the circuit, draw the circuit, drill the circuit, etch the circuit. Yeah. So a clear idea, a clear narrative has to be had. Like, okay, this is how we go from one to the next. Mm -hmm. Based on the dependencies, there's like, okay, before we do the plotting, we have to build the plotter attachment and things like that. Right. Just basics. Yeah. Uh, so this one should make sense then. And the circuit that you're talking about, is that uh, any specific circuit or is it? Yeah, I mean, the circuit that we, of interest was the, was the Arduino. Now, how mm -hmm. does that fit with the minimalist Arduino? Um, there may be two routes. One is the super, super simple thing where you just solder components directly onto a chip uh, but but a chip in a socket so you don't you can take the chip out so the idea there is you do a chip and with only like a few components you make a working Arduino um, and the idea is that you program you still have to program it that that minimalist chip minimalist design doesn't have the, the infrastructure where you actually can program it like a through a USB port it's not in there too, too much so we just take out the chip and put it into a working Arduino and program it through a USB port of a working Arduino. But that, that little experiment, I think, is very powerful. So what's the narrative behind it? It's so powerful because you, you take a chip that's a dollar, you know, costs a dollar from the store, and you make a functional pro microcontroller using just with a basic few connections, right? That's very powerful. I think we should, we should show that. I think it explains to people quickly like the basics too of all yeah. Arduino, all Raspberry oh, yeah. Pi, all of that whole movement. Yeah. People, you know, it, it all of a sudden have like a really base understanding of how that comes together. It's I think useful. I think that's yeah. I agree with that. And then okay, so that may be not that practical because typically if you have a circuit, you need to mount it solidly on you know just for logistics and practical use purposes. A little soldered dead bug. It's called dead bug where you solder things right onto the components. Um, dead bug soldering style that's what it's called well not highly practical you have to attach say you run it in a brick press well you got to attach it to something right so you, you typically want to attach it on on a substrate like a circuit board but the other possibility here is you could do either circuit boards or 3d printed boards so uh, and we haven't done the 3d printing boards so much but we did the the circuit boards where we for example drilled it or used strip board circuit board um, so the minimal start we know would be that we can take that socket with the microprocessor and then we can use the CNC drill to make holes for that socket and for a couple of other components and uh, so we have two routes one is the super simple minimalist one and then the more functional one where it's on a circuit board so it's solid and you can mount it mm -hmm. or on a 3d printed circuit board where 
okay, now how do you do it on a 3D printed circuit board? Well, you still have to, you have to make the connections. Uh, mm -hmm. You would have to, on a printed circuit, 3D printed board, you would have to just simply solder wires. But on the, on the copper clad board, if that's the substrate, you could be etching that. That could be the thing where we drew that, we etch it. We might do a process like we take the, the board, we drill the holes in it first, then we put in the plotter attachment, then we draw the circuit around that, and then we etch it. And then we've got holes and a circuit pattern, and then you can populate it with circuits for a fully functional Arduino. That's pretty powerful if we could do that. Or you can take without the, the CNC drawing, you can connect the holes with a marker by hand and then etch it. So there's, so we have to figure out which exactly. Do you think you could do both of those if you can do one? I yeah, think we could do both if we yeah. can do one. Yeah, like but, more, but I agree I'm that it might kind of slow things down. So maybe it's more like we have the, you know, start with the, um, what's the title of that software? Inkscape and the drawing of a, some kind of sticker. And then the next step is the drilling, like the circuit idea. And it could go even further that you just described. You could have a couple of different ways of getting there. And it is, I don't know. I wonder so much about the curriculum and the time. Is there a way that- Well, there's a time limit. The only thing we can do right. if you want to do both, say we've got a Maybe. full class. I mean, if you've got a full class of 12 people, have six people do one and six people do the other. Oh, that'd, that'd be, be good. Be, yeah, that would be good. That'll be like the multiple track. But if you have like two people, yeah, no, be that, ready for multiple gotta, tracks. Basically, you can't have multiple yeah, tracks. Yeah, right. So but they could uh, be like choose your own adventure. Still, people can like they can decide. Maybe if that is that going to make sense, or is it, if we, I guess it sort of depends. I how think ready it's we are. One curriculum for, as a base for curriculum, and then we can modify that as as necessary. Yeah, um, getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, yeah, we want right. to have the base like. It's like the, when it comes to, because we have the third day also, so we don't put everything in the second day. Um, yeah, yeah. For the more bigger Arduino, as as you had it before, at least you had you know first going through modular electronics, then KiCad, the designing Arduino Uno, parting and etching it, soldering an Arduino Uno. Um, if we do that on day two, that would be too much. Uh, so if you want to do something small on day two, maybe one of those mini. Arduino, so I don't know how long, long that type takes, or doing um, a tag or something, or small symbol or something, which which Jessica mentioned. Um, well, we have to go through. So, to validate feasibility here, we have to come up with a detailed plan and then validate it, like actually test it. Okay, can we actually do that in an hour or two? You know, so we have to test out all the pieces. Yeah. Um, do them up and test them. And not only test them, like the, the author tests it, and then the other instructors, they have to replicate that experiment to make sure that they can do that. Yeah. Um, but we still, like, if we, we need to focus on what we want to deliver as well. Um, just so we don't start with, if we take everything for the second day as an aim, we still need to fill the third day with something, even if we don't later decide that, okay, we can't do it on the second day. Um, so now when we take away the electric motors, we have a little bit of space, at least theoretically, uh, if yeah. you look at the generous. Uh, because we made the 3D printer much shorter um, regarding universal access a little bit shorter. And if we pre-assemble the extruders. Um, yeah, we'll, the extruder. we'll be tied on the first day. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, and the mail from Mitch, we're talking he was the one you talked about with uh, doing this Arduino Mini, was it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Mitch said he can commit to minimal Arduino and getting an instructional around that to make that happen. He's the one that he. I asked him, uh, Mitch, uh, what I showed him the thing that we did in New Zealand. He said, "Oh, the leads are too long. That the the little capacitors have to be right next to the pins. Otherwise, it's not going to work." So that was his feedback. So okay, so he knows what he's talking about, um, mm. since he's a electronics guy. But yeah, yeah. Uh, he said he could do that starting and working on it in June. 
um, where it's, I'm trying to, to fi figure out how to combine TankCAD, plotting and etching, uh, and then soldering. Yeah, well... So if that would be this Mini, or if the Mini would be a side product, but yeah. Could well, you, okay, that? so here's the, the links that exist. KiCad, you can get a actually put in the components of the mini you call it the mini the minimalist arduino we'll called the mini yeah you can get a circuit diagram now as far as the actual layout well the keycad typically assumes that you've got a circuit board so like for that one you're not you can't really do a layout proper layout but you can do the actual thing where you go from part libraries and you drag in the components so that's a lesson, a minimalist lesson in KiCad, where you're generating the, the actual schematic for your minimalist Arduino. And then if you have KiCad and you want to do actual circuit paths, like the actual tool paths, then you have to do something that you would do on a copper clad board. But that's exactly that. We can we can do the then the make all the connections within KiCad, KiCad and then circuit plot it so there's a tool chain from keycad to circuit plotting which i believe mm -hmm. right now includes keycad flat cam and inkscape flat cam is the other piece of software which converts the output of keycad into i think g code and then uh and then, then Inkscape, well, thing. Inkscape in that case doesn't exist. It's KiCad to to FlatCam Free. to Plotter, which is Marlin. Okay. Marlin software on a D3D Universal ac access machine. So what we're doing just for perspective is we're running all the software through Marlin, the standard 3D printer software. So that's that's the thing. We're using that same interface to run, hit run, uh, and we're using all getting all these functions out of it. So that's, that's pretty cool because I mean, uh, people don't do that. They typically use dedicated tool chains for that. We're we're saying here we've got Marlin. Well, it can do all these things already. Why don't we do it with that so we don't have to learn three other tools? Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of this integrated, uh, uh, tight packed lesson using minimal minimal amount of components. Um, all right, so we can see how long time it takes to do the mini and if it comes to it, and how long time it takes to do the combined uh, drill and plotter. And if we have time to do the mini at the same time, then maybe we can do the mini on day two, and then we use KiCad to do the plotting and etching and, and circuits for mm -hmm. something a bit more ambitious. Um, and then on yeah. the fourth day, then Designing battery pack, build a battery pack, um, yeah. um, charger, hardware, and, and software. Um, and yep. And welder was in the well, battery pack. Um, right. What's to be said about that? If if we're making battery packs, I think the welder is still because uh, because all those things are so tightly related. Like if you do the power electronics things, that's an Arduino plus some power elements, but that's what the welder is it's arduino plus power elements but you have to have another you have to have an inductor in there as well um if we have the battery packs the welder is doable but that's the thing where you stack a bunch of those packs together it's not like if you have one pack you can't do it you have to have like six people's packs six times six like 36 batteries that makes a perfect case for a small welder uh that, that can run for like I think it can run like 20 minutes of just welding power which is a cool thing yeah so we should try it i think we should try it <clears throat> uh, welding is pretty important like at the relevance to 3d printing is that you put a 3d on a 3d printer you put a welder head and you you're printing in metal for near net shape full metal objects <clears throat> that are accurate to like three millimeters so that's very useful but anyway um Tight, tight relationship between batteries, power electronics. So if we can crack power electronics, I mean, the power electronics are important for chargers, welders, induction furnaces. Like if we talk about authentically, um, communities 
mastering their local production, which includes steel. I don't see why every community wouldn't have a an induction furnace to roll out virgin steel from scrap. That's uh, right now that industry is very centralized, hmm. and I think there's consciousness happening that it can't be that centralized, <laughs> shouldn't be that centralized. So anyway, that I think there's a real practical an education case for that the power electronics bit. But then we need um, five participants plus one instructor. Yeah, we need, uh, at that point, we would need at least five, like yeah. six. So that the welder, we can do like, so how do you substitute the welder? Well, you can want, run one. There's other ways, like you can run it off the wall too. 120 AC which requires a different circuit um, which is a more complicated like not more complicated requires other parts we can and also the other thing there's a practicality there too because that runs into insurance issues actually uh, for some practical considerations like where 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 you're in a low <laughs> low legal zone uh, you, you don't have to worry about this, but if you say you, you go into a high school and they've, they're tight about insurance, you might not be able to do the welder part. Yeah. That's, we found that out already, like we're, with the San Diego event, we were, um, there's limitations for what insurance can, can handle, like we'd have to negotiate that case by case. But short of the welding, like you can, we can still do a lot of the experiments with the power electronics, like say the, the battery charger or um, charger or motor controller or things like that. Um, the welding, it's, you know, like, yeah, for the schools, the, unfortunately, there's that little complication of insurance, but... I was going to say that that insurance issue probably, probably comes in when it's 18, 18 and under, because they have, they have they're adults, adults, they can sign their own waiver. waiver. Yeah, you can't put yeah, that, that's people under 18 in anything that risks their... Yeah, like for example, they have shop class in in um, in high schools, right? Yeah, so that's right. that's like I just got a. But they almost don't do anything. Like, well, the difference being, yeah, the shop class. If you live in an industrial town like Marquette, where the high school guys are all welding, they have huge plasma welders and humongous MIG and TIG welders because they're all going to work in automobile yeah. shops or something. It's a different scene. Yeah. Must be different insurance, uh, age based. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Okay. But no, we should. We should. Uh, I think we should go forward with um, with the welder. I think if, uh, if people can't do that, too bad. They're missing out. They'll. They'll. We'll cut out. We'll modify the curriculum a little bit there. Um, yeah. But no, we should. We should plan on it. Because okay. once again, like if we don't have the batteries, we can still do. But then again, why are we talking about low populations? That's that's a bad mindset here. We we gotta say no. We're gonna fill it up with twelve people. Um, but for the backup, like like part of the lessons there is like we also want to learn about rectification. So if you take one twenty AC and you rectify to get one twenty DC, and you can work with that if you, but you have to transform that down to the working voltage of the welder, mm -hmm. uh, which yeah. right now there's not a clear way to do it. Um, well, there's there's a clear way, but you need more components. Might be a little beyond the scope. Um, yeah, battery is easier because you can use the same design in uh, any region. Yeah. Um, whereas we wouldn't in Europe we wouldn't be able to use the same design as in uh, yeah in this, for example. No, it's true. Well, they're, they're close. The designs are pretty close to like for example the way we did the light dimmer I think the way we designed it was it would work in Europe and here because because the components could handle 120 or 240 and mm -hmm. then it would be a minor change in software um, mm -hmm. now even though with a case like with multiple part like if there's not enough participants well the instructor they should have a stash of batteries with them too so um, yeah yeah so we yeah we should just plan on the batteries and uh, I think I think to develop robust battery packs that are scalable for all forms I mean that's very useful because because you're talking about any powered device power tools and cars I mean Tesla cars run on the same batteries that we use the 18650s so mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, um, very, very useful. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah. So, anything more regarding the schedule? Um, no, we have to refine. We have to uh, attach people's names to specific parts. I've got the so I've got the three D printer refinements on the simplifications there. <clears throat> yep. Um, exactly. And um, check in with Michelle and Chris. You got their emails. Um, let's see, yeah. I don't know if I have their emails. And Chris is Slack. And Tom. I mean, Tom could do some of the power electronics. He did the light dimmer. Uh, he did it on a breadboard. <clears throat> um, one thing on the power electronics curriculum is, is whether to approach it by breadboard or more like the 3D printed style. Like if we have the 3D printers working, we can make the 3D printed circuit boards where we mount the components, which is useful, I think, because plastic is an insulator, so it can be a good substrate. And we wanted to play with those interesting things where we have cooling heat sinks with little fans that we already use in a 3D printer in the extruder head. We can mount the power elements to those meaning that we're showing this interesting ecology where the power electronics go into the same kind of heat heat system elements like as in the extruder head which is a hot element with cooling that kind of same technology applies to the the power electronics cooling uh, which is an interesting concept for people to learn um uh, point is tom could possibly help with some of that if he's available um, so I think we're weakest maybe on the fourth day. Um, but we have done the little packs. The packs we did in Texas were, that, that design is online. It, it doesn't, it, it's okay, it doesn't work well. We had problems with making solid, good contacts, so we gotta refine the way we make contacts. Um, that's a good, good first prototype. Uh -huh. Do you say that Tom can help with the design of the battery packs uh, module, or which parts? Uh, more like the power electronics thing. But he did uh, actually end up getting the printer. He has the D3D Universal, so he might be able to help out. <clears throat> yeah, uh, we should follow up on Slack as well. And uh, see, I think almost everyone are on Slack. I don't see you so often there much. In so looking forward to that. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> oh, where's the where's the main link to that? Uh, where's uh, let's see if we go maybe like on. Um, I would download the app. That's definitely easiest to use. Um, generally, that's the biggest difference between the people who use Slack and don't use Slack is, is who don't. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, all right. I think Ubuntu should have one as well. Definitely. Um, Do, does someone have to be invited to that? Or if you give them a link, that's an invitation I link? Let's make a new link. Uh, let's make a new link now. Let's put it in um, dev team log. Let's put a link to that. Hmm. I'm making a note because I can't see it if you find it directly. Um, and for Chris? Yeah. Um, you mentioned which parts do you think that he can well, Chris, help with? Chris is skilled at the 3D printing part. The he did the plotter. Uh, he did the circuit drill. Well, I was asking basically what he thinks of him. We should pull Holger in there as well. 
because he's uh, in the January camp. He did some good development there. <clears throat> Do you have his contacts? Yeah. I'll forward you that. Yep. Correct. Uh, because Peter and Holger, I think they were involved. Um, I mean, you can check in with uh, so the guys from Hamburg who are gonna run the Steam Camp. So that's um, ch maybe check in with Benedict as well. Now that we're roping people in. Um, hmm. also check with Don. I mean, Don from the first, first event, he, he might be, he emailed me saying if we need any help. Um, is it Don? Yeah, D-O-N. And then, uh, since, since Jonathan has attended the first one, he dropped in for a couple of days. He did the video here. I got it. Jonathan, uh, check in with him too. So maybe, um. Okay. Round up all the people. Mm. All right, Chris. Um, While we're at it, now you know that from um, also Ian from New Zealand, he wanted to uh, do a g really good documentation of ripping the thing apart and a good instructional video on an entire build of the printer, like because we built it and he said he was going to take all his students and do a video because he he run he teaches video. So he said he was going to do that. I haven't checked back in on that. I'm not sure what happened. Um, but we can check in if he, he can uh, contribute to that. Because a nice video of the whole build process would be a good thing. Naturally, it's... Uh, let's work with everybody that we've got on it. Uh, and another question regarding... So how, how do we do for events where someone contributes to a steam camp but they are not the instructor uh, contributes like how you like mean, they make the one, one hour module, one hour lesson module. well the um, the general notion is that that's a product and that could be used for uh for people to run workshops of any kind anywhere like we can uh, if we have all these modules we can talk about also just smaller events where we run run different things but uh uh, we don't have specific events like that planned right now, but these could be webinars or live events like meetups, you know, like this this can feed yeah. into a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. so it's good. Self-contained. I will also try to make a video of how to use the uh, lesson templates. Yeah, um, nice. No, it's really good. I, I like it. It looks like uh, there's some structure there. Looks like we're going to gobble up Wikipedia. That's the plan. <laughs> okay, great. So that's the first point. Awesome. Um, yeah, Taiwan. So, right? how's yeah, it going to work? Like, I mean, we we don't have a specific event planned for August right now because it's like we can't plan right now because with, but we are saying something like July, around July time, do a filament maker thing. Now, for his camp, like maybe we can rerun the, the filament maker and some of us can get involved. That's the way I could see it. So if he, if he wants to do that, I think we can ride on top of the, the filament maker work. Yeah, yeah because, because for him, he would like to do it in the end of uh, August. Uh, yeah. So basically the 22nd of August, if that would be possible. Um, and I mean, holding, holding a on-site event in Taiwan. So basically using the same information that we had for the January and March event, but of course we need to remake it um, and making the yeah. shredder. Um, How would you assess the level of risk for, I mean, like, until there's a there's a vaccine, like the, the, the blow-ups of the the COVID can happen at any time, it's, it's risky. What's your take on that, yeah. Jessica and Andreas? Because on, on some part, there's all these people rushing to get back to work. But on the other thing, the reality is an explosion of the disease can happen any time as long as there's a single sick person. Any any city can explode. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so when it comes to risk management, I mean, there, there's the... Can I scroll down more? 
that's both the COVID-19 and the other one is the indirect effects of the COVID-19. So right now, for example, when he's trying to source supplies for himself, he's getting difficulties because, well, first, the parcels don't necessarily arrive time or arrive at all, um, and it can be difficult to find it for good prices and such. So yeah. there's a actual problem on getting the supplies. Yeah. Um, and we're seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing which we need to look close on, on how to do. Um, he's also looking at how much he can get locally from, from within Taiwan. But of course, if people get sick in Taiwan, uh, that would still be risky. Um, one thing that we talked about, which was also concerning um, on the feasibility of the event, is to have some kind of escape switch. So if people can't uh, make it, then they can choose on whether or not they want to cancel the event or do an online event. So an alternative would be to remake it into an online event. Um, and the other one is our right to say that, okay, this camp is not fe feasible. So by a certain date, um, we have the right to say, sorry, we're not going to hold the camp because it's, it's not possible. Um, but we need to, to know at what how many participants we want to have and at what date do we yeah. able to have um, the event so we don't buy and source products before uh, we realize that we can't hold the events. Um, well, how does that apply to the August, late August? I mean, I think we should proceed at it as like, that's that's got to be rem I would suggest remote. I mean, because if, if it's not remote, you're adding more risk into it. And then you're going to be doing mm -hmm. all this planning, and if it doesn't happen, it's uh, can be a wasteful thing. Um, it would be if there's a second wave, but of course it is really useful. Um, uh, yeah, I'll talk to him tomorrow again. As it is right now, they, they have quite. I mean, they are, are very alert on containment since their previous source experience. Um, so they manage quite fast this time, so if it's, there's a second wave, I think they will manage quite fast as well. But of course, the way they manage it is also m might be through lockdown, even if it was contact tracing and closing all airports uh, the first time. Yeah. Um, so it, I think it's smaller risk in Taiwan than, than countries who have geographical borders to other nations uh, that they would get a... Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Um, hmm. but, um, that's also why it's kind of the safest place to start with. The other safe, safest would be people or countries which are building herd immunity. Um, and there maybe actually Sweden would be possible, uh, definitely by the autumn. Um, but well, what, countries, in, what country be, besides Taiwan? Uh, Sweden. Um, because it's it will have herd immunity by Python. Uh, How are you guys doing this, that? So by the end of this month, we will be at 30% in Stockholm. Um, so in a few more months, it will approach 50 and later 70%. Plus, there's no lockdown, so people can go on the um, events, even if, if people wouldn't be immune. Um, oh, interesting. So that's working for Sweden? Uh, yeah, it, it's working. Uh, and it hasn't run over our capacity either. So the strategy from Sweden is a bit different from other countries. So people, every individual are responsible to assess whether or not they need to stay home or if they they can go out. And if they go out, they, they need to assess whether it's important enough uh, to go out. So people get the information and then every individual take their own responsibility. Wow, uh, that's less. amazing. And what's the percentage death rate um, so the death rates, I think it would be hard uh, right now. The death rate is calculated to be similar to to other countries such as uh, England, um, but because they only test people who go to the hospitals, uh, since the assumption would be that everyone would get it anyway. So they only test people who are in the risk zone, so hmm. go to the hospital. Don't really know the death rate until it's over right now. They only have statistical models on, on assumed death rates. Uh, but they're quite quite normal. The emergency hospitals are not filled yet, so that's that's good. Uh, and we're over the peak, so it should should be fine. Hmm. 
what's the what's the so pro- that's projected sure. that's pretty amazing what's the projected um number of deaths and like why did for example so why is it working there is it because you guys are more uh, more enlightened or like how because england tried that initially and they said no way there's going to be too much death so what's the difference there um the difference so england and sweden basically have the same approach um and i don't know why england stopped doing it if their death rate became too big or not but the intensive capacity uh, was not projected to be overrun uh, and it hasn't been so our military helped building hospitals which has not been uh, used yet uh, one of the assumptions is well first of all people there's a lot of people who live alone uh, i think we have the highest percentage of people who live alone and people see. move out very quickly uh, and the other thing is that there's a very high trust towards the government so people um, compared to some other countries where people might not uh, follow like what they assume is best so that's another assumption cultural assumption so it's just partly how we live and partly culture and then thirdly is that we don't have as dense uh, population as so the denser the bigger cities you have the faster it spreads which is why Stockholm is the only city which spread quite fast in Sweden huh so the idea is well, like instead of dragging it out over like a year by minimizing contact you guys are actually accepting like a fast is it actually a faster rate of getting towards herd immunity they don't call it herd immunity but it's basically what it is um so it's it's calculated like how much how how uh, what kind of actions do we need to take to stay under the capacity of our healthcare and then they take those actions but not harder actions oh. because if you take harder actions then uh, in their calculations more people would die due to uh, depression or, or being um, being sick or, or also if um, economical like side effects um, wow so, yeah. wow that's it's quite interesting it got a lot of criticism um, including from from China. I think after China, they criticized Sweden and England at the same time. And I think the day after, England changed their strategy. Uh-uh. Wow. What's the general consensus in Sweden? Like, is it working for people, or they're like they're not liking it? So it depends. I notice where people come from. So um, Swedish people in in Sweden generally seem to trust it quite a lot. In the beginning, there were, were a lot of discussions like why is that this happening then over time um, it seems most people seem to think it makes sense there's still some people who think that it doesn't make sense um, or that there are some some key elements which could have been better for example uh, better protection for nursing homes and things like that but otherwise there's quite high trust in the system do you have protests um, happening no not really angry facebook messages by people who disagree um, Hmm. That sounds pretty enlightened. That's pretty. Sounds. I think good. there's one big difference in Sweden, in Swedish governance compared to other countries, and that is that our ministers are not allowed to intervene in how the governmental agencies are executing the laws. Uh, so our prime minister can't tell the health agency that they need to change their strategy, for example, uh, which Trump would, as an example, would be able to do. So they can't change things based on if for example the, the population would uh, pressure the prime minister to do something else he can't do something else unless oh, he changed wow. the law and it's up to the the um, health agency to interpret those laws and execute it but they can't change how they execute it so i think that's another factor which impacts so you basically have depoliticized some of the government institutions um when deep politicize the execution of it um but not the like what their role is mm. wow okay huh interesting all right um sorry for that off track uh, so yeah um uh, no, so thank you thank you for sharing that no because that's very important because how will you go about planning like just because i'm still somewhat confused on that issue um uh, yeah 
but no, that's that's an imp interesting data point on what can happen. Okay, but go ahead. Hmm. Um, so, so I'll, I'll talk uh, to Siraj tomorrow, I think, uh, no, on Sunday, um, and we'll discuss if it's better to do it remotely or not, and then we can write back a risk assessment um, to you and, and everyone else, and people can pitch in. Um, but if, in regardless if we do it remotely or not, um, I would like to start the marketing by early June. He will do, do his test by the end of um, by the first week, like the second or the ninth of May, depending on when he gets his parts. Um, and after that, we should start the. What's a prerequisite marketing. for marketing? So. It depends on which type of marketing we do, but preferably we need to know the location um, and have a general overview of what we do. Uh, we need. To, I would like to have the curriculum decided, but not necessarily that we have finished all of the different modules. But if we do it an online curriculum, then I think we have to be much stricter on on having it prepared. So. Um, then we should probably wait for the marketing a little bit later to assess whether or not we actually can do an online session at that time. What I would, my suggestion on the marketing is that our marketing is much more compelling if we have really good clarity on the content. Like I think that our video is pretty good, but I think there could be an extra level of credibility that comes from being more explicit about it. I would yeah. So. The I think we decided like the overall curriculum as um, by the end of May, definitely. Um, we should have some possible. like uh, yeah, I mean we should we're, we should have like some good videos, like a good compelling video of the whole narrative of of the Steam Camp. Um, I think that would be the most most powerful marketing asset if we're talking about getting people uh, involved. So a good video, a good script, and good preview of the content that is pretty tight like i think that would be like in terms of I, I like the marketing video but it's a marketing video and you can see it um i think like an, at the next level at least in my view like the next level where you're really sharing like how how that work like if we give people a good idea of what the workflow is to get a much more realistic expectation of the outcome mm -hmm. um i don't know that's that's my feedback on it Do you still have a group who helps with marketing videos? Um, yeah, uh, I don't know if uh, so. That's that's actually, <clears throat> yeah, my mentor on that. Now he's given the cr the crisis here. I mean, he's got he's running a billion dollar company, so he's got his hands full too. So, um, not sure what we can expect there. Right. Um, so for the marketing, so in, in the future, I think I will just create a Google event and add it uh, because the DuckDuckGo and, and Google uh, disagrees on, on the American time zones. So, um, or if I use the universal one, but uh, for marketing materials, I put out a few different things, but both the things you saw on the wiki, um, but also so that we have a schedule template that we can use each time we have a new uh, app. So we know approximately when to start with different parts, like uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram. Not necessarily do we have to follow it 100%, but it's it's a good start to make sure that everything gets done and there's a little bit time for different types of, of marketing. Um, and getting branding, especially in, in the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. But I will continue to host Tuesday meetings and whoever show up can show up. And if no one show up, then, then I will continue working on it uh, by myself. Um, and then over time, integrate it with what happens with 180 degree consulting. Um, Did anyone show up this Tuesday? Um, I think someone wanted to show up. But showed up one hour earlier. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, Alvaro. Yeah. 
Great, thanks. So next time I'll send a an invitation. I will add you to the invitation. Um, okay, great. And we talked a little bit about Google, you and me, Marching. Um, mm -hmm. And there are some other tactics which are, were put down earlier regarding uh, Twitter's SEO and such. But I should make it a little bit prettier. And that's something we can work on. Uh, now, Lord Loris, if, if you're interested in this, we can work on it together to, to make sure that all the pictures are in the uh, most optimal format and, and putting it in the right place and such. Um, and what's to uh, be said about the stand-up? Yeah, so when it comes to stand-up, there I'm thinking people who work full-time or almost full-time, so especially you and me. Um, I don't know how much uh, time other people have, like Elbor, for example, but anyone who, who works fully committed on this, it would be really good to have a like 15 minutes daily stand-up um, just where we go through what we're doing and our tasks and, and can move, uh, work what's through. The, what's through. the latest you can do that in a day? So it's latest in my day. The latest in a day? Um, well, this time, okay. basically, um, if that works. Yeah, can we try for three? That's your 10? Yeah, that's my 10. Um, Is that three too late? Or? Minutes where we can do it. OK, let's try it. Let's just add it. All right. And Shredder. So how do you go about having a project? How much do you prepare in advance? Do we need to do anything in regards to the Shredder development, um, like parts and such? Yeah, I mean, we want to. I, I was thinking that this is a remote event, and we we s send out blades, and I would have had it tested pretty well for good grinding using a drill, so that people don't have to buy a power unit, drill, and a three D printed uh, gear down. So basically, a finished product, like a, a ready product. Um, well, I. S uh, not a finished product. There's a product uh, stages pr product release on a wiki. <laughs> look at that page. <laughs> no, seriously, take a look at the page stages product release. No, it'll be a definitely a good first prototype. Not a first prototype, a second or third prototype because we've built them before. Um, take a look at this stages product release. So something people need to understand. No, like like when you build something, it doesn't mean it's a product. It's a, it means it's a good prototype. Yeah. There's a very <laughs> big difference between it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, my uh, point was we have not stated all of everything from scratch in a blueprint design and such, um, or if they have we, how much we give them to work with. Yeah, like what, we, what I envision happening is that what's been built, like the first proto, the second, let's call it second prototype since we built the precious plastic ones before here a couple of times. Uh, so call it like a second prototype that's documented that you can work directly off of that so if you want to build it you can replicate it and it will w give you decent results for shredding um, mm. and uh, now also with that is is the filament maker so filament makers we've built uh, so what I would do is have that whole system I'd, I'd really want to have this thing up and running and I'm showing that okay here I'm making filament look at this this is what you can do so and that's marketing that's that's marketing material that you can say okay here's an experimental shredder that we're making the next development the next development would be to fix this one bug or something or make something better um, mm -hmm. here's the, our next step towards a, a product that uh, that works uh, the goal the very explicit goal is something that can produce real economic results so mm. real production of filament that people can actually sell. That's the goal. Yep. Um, right, yeah. But I don't build both the shutter and the filament maker as it is right now. Say it um, again? That's the, the plan in the beginning at least. It's, it's not to build both the shutter and filament maker, even if that's something which might happen uh, further on. Well, um, um, I think if 
So what we do, I mean, I think it can happen. So in five days you can. That depends on having that decent prototype that you build from a proof from a thing that already works and you you know like we've I've done it I've documented it it works here's how you can do it relatively quickly because the design is re relatively simple uh, so that's the ideal and it could be we can frame it as okay here's the five day ex ex uh, intensive experiment but then we might have continue follow-up meetings on that right so we can host okay let's meet next Saturday for a couple hours developing the next thing with all of us actually having these things in functional shape so that we're maybe uh, doing some collaborative, real collaborative design with a bunch of people that actually have the machine working at a decent state. Uh, that's, that would be the ideal. I mean, that was the whole thing about the steam camps is that we do, we get so far and then we continue development through regular meetings and, and future, future camps. So, yeah. That's great. Um. Right, yeah, I was thinking something. Okay, that was good. Let's see. Okay. Um, I was thinking something similar. So, in we developed, if we look on it on a meta level of steam camps, that we move towards circular economy, uh, beginning with plastics in that case, um, it would be great. And it would, would be really awesome also if we can make our own useful motors so that we can use them also in the um shredder yeah um, yeah it's it's i mean the way i'm looking at it these days it's like it's about bodies it's about enough people showing up to to just do all these things because none of this is any rocket science it's just a little bit of yeah. integration it's about a focused development like if the biggest thing we can accomplish is the idea that we teach people the the time binding concept which is look any little piece that you put on the wiki if well organized brings the whole project forward that mm. is the core of the message. Any little contribution that you make brings the project forward. If we can get to that level, that's 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 success. Because then people can do little contributions that actually are moving the whole thing forward. And um, that's where we're trying to get to. I see the good hints, like with a little template, the, like the dev template, the dev template template. That in itself shows me a lot of promise because if you can just seed like all the proper direction of documentation in a in a second, that's a great start. I can tell you that's a great start right there. That plus a couple of of uh, info box templates and a little bit of infrastructure, and you can for each project that you do, you can have a very very concerted effort of moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the development template that's the one that you mean um, that you showed where. We get that dashboard and percentage yeah. for different steps. Yeah, yeah I actually uh, uh, put up another one. I dev, it's just dev. So double bracket dev pipe zero equals project name. Um, see, here, let me sh share you my screen. Uh, so let me show you how beautiful, how inspiring this is. Take a look at it. So I go to uh, test. Okay, so we got whatever we got there. Um, map of developers, but here, double bracket. Uh, and I do, typically I do substitute. And dev, I just shorten it to dev, uh, it's dev template. And then pipe, the, what, what do you want the name of the project? So zero equals, <laughs> Andrea. Do you know for some reason I only see small square? Um, oh, you do. do you know how I change? Oh yeah, so yeah. go to upper right corner and select the presenter. Uh, oh, you have to go into yeah, like okay. speaker right. one. Put me on there, right. and then test. So let's do it again. Subst yeah. colon dev and then pipe zero equals so Andreas open source um, shredder. Okay. 
That's it. See this? I mean, the fact that you can now click on, like say you had an idea, so you would click on three, conceptual design. And there you go. I had an idea that, do you have any insights on the shredder? Um, to be able to change the grind size, depending on your oh, yeah. experience. Well, that would actually go, go into, so that goes, they'll be in a requirement. So, uh, shred size is, is um, size is selectable, is adjustable. Yeah, but the thing is like, you know, little things like this make a difference. So yeah, so you just added just a little bit of content. So now you see th this template, it's got some content already filled in and then you do the percent like fill in the percent. Um, but that's kind of we got to get people thinking about this. Okay, this is like little contributions that are actually adding and they're organized in this template. And they're moving forward. Because like the way I want to explain this concept, uh, the idea of like whole fract fractality of it, I guess you'd call it um, fractality of this thing, we call it fractality. But say I develop the requirements and value proposition to immense detail, like I detail out every single thing. Well, that literally gets you to like a conceptual design and literally like a technical design of 3D CAD. Like, in other words, like when you develop each aspect to the limit, it gets you far along the completion of all the other 20 steps. So, for example, if in the shredder requirement you said use a CNC cut half inch plate. Well, already you've you've informed a whole bunch about the BOM. You know the BOM is gonna have like uh, half inch, half inch mild steel CNC cut plate. You know, uh, so so the way it works, like the way you can synthesize a lot of collaboration is by people understanding that concept too. That if you develop any part, like first of all, documented because any part matters if it's focused towards development and then it helps to inform all the other parts so if you have a large team the way it works the part of this iterative development the way it works you have to keep looking at other stuff like just keep looking at what other people have done and that informs like all the other elements so if you say like oh uh, I don't know how to start the 3d CAD well look at what the requirement says can you actually reify something from the requirement into CAD as even just a seed file that's just a plain start, like a very tiny start. But that's the concept. Like people have to understand that the little contributions matter. And this is a concept called called time binding in general semantics. The idea that humans have the unique capacity to build upon prior knowledge by building upon little pieces from before. That's time binding in action. But that's that's the beauty. I see hints that this could actually, you know, we can get enough people to understand this so that enough people can actually collaborate on that in a meaningful way. Yeah, I'm trying to make it as both self-explaining as possible, and so people will need to put down as little effort in, as possible yeah. to to get into it, so we get down the oh, level yeah. of entrance. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I feel quite ready. I don't think there I have. Let's just check. Uh, okay. Yeah, so let's do that. And then we've got, I've got the other meeting if you want to join us on the marketing team in, in an hour. Or you can, well, you can uh, join it or you can watch the video. Yeah, I will see it because it will be quite quite late and then I'll never get up. Um, but it's the okay. same place then in one hour from now. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Great. One so, yeah. One, one last question. So one thing with as the wiki is right now, it's, it is very decentralized. I think it's quite hard for people to take in the the information about it or like creating a a narrative. It is in a way interacting information and non-binary information. So um, in thinking a little bit about it, I also read read some research about how like to communicate non-binary information. Yeah. And storytelling works 
quite well, even if it's for things like teaching risk management or, or teaching things. What does work um, well? Storytelling. Storytelling. Yeah. Um, so, for example, if you want to risk uh, teach people about risk management in chemistry, instead of saying that it's, it's uh, like acid things are bad against your your hand, you can tell a story about someone who, who I don't know, dropped acid on, on them. And, and, yeah, anyway, it's not, not the best yeah. Uh, yeah. description. Okay. Um, I'll apply it. Um, thoughts regarding like how we can get people to get a coherent narrative of it in terms of, of the how to become a OSC developer um, yeah. or which type of story, which is the narrative we can tell. Maybe we can make a video about that in a way that people actually learn the process um, somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, any ideas? I don't know how to do that. That's a good question. Because um, you have to end up transferring technical information. How do you wind a story around it? Yeah, you can you can do a case case study of something. Like a case study of an excellent thing that people develop like a pretty much a far a thing like okay here's a, a make-believe story where you just show th this amazing development but it wraps in the whole development process in it but the story of what's been developed is fake because um, because that would make the most impact it lets your imagination wander wander yeah I don't know but yeah that's a that's a good question just a it wasn't any like I didn't have an answer either. Just a, a yeah problem, which I think this is kind of like what solve. people do with like some of these intro videos, like for projects for vaporware projects where some reality is not there yet, and they basically say, "Imagine this," right? Mm -hmm. So if you could do an "Imagine yeah. this" video with blend blending in some of the the reality that we have, yeah, yeah, I, I could see something like that happening. Have you seen? Garbage Warrior, the movie. Oh uh, no, I haven't. Um, I think you should see it. It's. it's uh, oh yeah, no, I actually have. Uh, I heard about it, but yeah. no, I didn't see the movie. Okay. Um, you think that's a good example a good of? It would be good if we had a similar movie for open source ecology. Oh okay, so we need to create a Garbage uh, Warrior for a, of OSC movie. Yeah. Yeah. Not of course, but but I was sorry because people really. I well, what I do you think? How much of that did reversing the Mississippi cover? Did it cover any of that? Reversing Mississippi? Yeah. That's a movie about us. It's a one hour movie. Oh, you haven't seen uh, it? Probably not. Uh, okay. Um, I don't know where you find it. Like, um, Take a look at that. See what you think about that. <clears throat> There's a trailer for it and stuff, but I'm not sure where. It... Here's uh, Google to see if you can find a copy of this, but and let me know. Like, I mean, that captured a part of the story when we were building a tractor and stuff. It's a pretty cool movie. I like it. Uh, I'll watch it. Yeah. Is it free? Uh, it, it went on PBS, so I think you can okay. find it on PBS somewhere, hopefully. I like the description, an eccentric inventor and an urban farmer comes together. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Sorry. And you're back. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk, um, uh, the stand up. Yeah. Um, starting from Monday. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.